Uh, hi, Steph. That's great to see you. My name is Alex and I'm from James Cook Media. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your wonderful Siege of Paris soundtrack. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, and uh, my first question uh, uh, also comes from me as a musician. Uh, the first instrument is very important for uh, any musician. It kind of defines the path. You can learn and master any other instruments, but the first one remains special for me, it's keyboards. Uh, and so how did you come to violin? Why did you choose it? Well, interestingly enough, I also started on piano. That was the first instrument that I took lessons on. Um, and I picked up violin probably a year or two years after that. And I just liked piano. I had this like one and a half octave, tiny little keyboard when I was a kid. And um, I just loved it. And my parents saw that I loved it. And they're like, okay, well, I guess we should get her lessons. So I took piano lessons pretty much all of my um, youthful days, I would say, uh, until I was 18 and went off to college. Um, but I picked up the violin uh, when I was like seven or eight because my sister played the viola and I saw her playing in orchestras and I loved string instruments. And she taught me how to hold the bow and she taught me all the fundamentals of the, of, uh, the instrument. And so I picked up violin shortly thereafter. And there was something about the violin that felt more natural, like it just clicked with me. Piano, I have played for a long time, but have always been quite bad. Like I'm, I'm a pretty, pretty horrible pianist. Um, but violin, I just, I, I loved it. I loved playing duets with my sister when we were growing up. I loved playing in orchestras. And that was just kind of the instrument that, that I feel is my primary instrument. Though piano always stuck with me because now as a composer, I write on piano. I write music on piano because it's so visual and I feel like I can really like flesh out themes and all of that. So my primary training in piano is still quite useful to this day, even if I'm terrible at the instrument. <laughs> Uh, and my next question, uh, I visited your website. It's very well done, by the way. I really found oh, a lot you. of interesting <laughs> Uh, and my next question is about Skywalker Ranch. So what uh, useful things did you learn there for your music career? Sundance Composers Lab was really such an unforgettable, amazing experience. Um, six fellows go up every year. I think they've changed the program slightly, but when I, when I was in the feature film program, it was six people who, six composers go up and you're there for two weeks and you meet with incredible mentors who are composers working professionally in the industry. Um, you rescore scenes from their projects, and then you also meet with Sundance filmmakers who come at, who come to Skywalker Ranch, and you score some of their short films or scenes from something that they've done. Um, so it's like an incredible creative experience. Um, that and being at Skywalker Ranch, it's just like the beauty is so incredible. It's such a rare opportunity to be able to like have a little fellowship there. Um, so the biggest takeaway for me when I was up at Skywalker was you know, there weren't like any rules. Uh, it, nobody was like, you need to do something this way. And for me, that was really liberating because I got to explore and experiment and do things that I wouldn't ordinarily do because I wasn't at risk of getting fired. You know, there weren't like the stakes weren't super high for it. It was just like, we want you to explore your creativity and just try new things. Um, so for me, that kind of blew my whole process wide open. Um, I didn't bring like a template of sounds with me. Like I kind of just like used that chance as a way to just discover new things, a new palette. And I started recording vocals when I was there, which is something I've never done before because I'm not a vocalist by any stretch of the imagination, but I just like threw up a mic and started experimenting and making weird sounds. And um, to this day, I still do that. So there was something about being there and just trying something for the sake of trying it that really was really critical to who I am now as a composer. Your collaboration with Harry Gregson Williams, one of the very no well-known Hollywood composers. Uh, so what was your role in the soundtrack? How did you help to create those soundtracks you worked on together? So I worked with Harry for six years as his composing assistant, his music assistant, um, which was a crazy, amazing ride. Six years is a long time to be doing that job, but um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Harry is an amazing mentor. Like he hired me to start working for him part-time when I was getting my master's degree at UCLA. And then once I graduated, he was like, you're full-time now. And we were such a small team then. It was just Harry, myself, and uh, Paul Thomason, who was a studio tech and music editor, just like such a brilliant person. Um, and so it was just the three of us for six years, basically. Um, so it was very, very intimate environment given, you know, what these Hollywood composer teams can look like. Um, so essentially I was responsible for anything on the music side that I could assist Harry with. Um, 
so writing cues, orchestrating cues, arranging cues, um, you know, helping record musicians, helping with score prep, uh, doing fixes, doing picture changes, um, conducting on the scoring sessions, being a booth reader in the scoring sessions. Um, so it ran the gamut. There was lots of responsibilities in that job, um, but essentially it was uh, an amazing creative collaboration uh, for six years. Often when we look through the credits, we see the line additional music. Uh, so can you tell our readers, what does that mean actually? So generally speaking, I mean, it varies. It does depending on who you're working with, who the lead composer is. An additional music credit is usually granted to a person who has contributed a significant amount of music to that score, original, originally composed music. Um, you know, sometimes it's five minutes of music on the score. Sometimes it's 80% of the score. It really depends on who it is that you're working with. Um, but essentially what it means, it's that you have had an important part in creating the DNA of the music for that particular score. So it's basically like lead composer credit and additional music credit. Like those are the two, you know, those are the people who are writing the score. Uh, you've had experience writing music for films, uh, TV series, documentary projects, and video games. They are so vastly different between each other. For example, if we take video games, people listen to it for hours, and actually it should be very good music. What's the most difficult to score? That's a great question. Um, Assassin's Creed The Siege of Paris was the first video game that I had ever done, so it was... There was a pretty steep learning curve um, and I was terrified most of the time because I was, I just apologized to them. I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing, but thank you for explaining it to me. Um, it, it was a different approach for sure than a film or TV score. Um, I had to be very aware of layering and making sure that the music could loop and still have interest. Um, as well as, you know, like uh, how do I create more tension by adding certain other layers on top of something right but that base layer still has to be very interesting because the player could be in that for several minutes um so it was just a different way of it was a different process for example i think the biggest challenge that i faced with it was for boss fights so as composers we generally want to like create shape and dynamic contrast and just like do different things in the evolution of a piece of music but for the video game implementation of the music, it was really important for the intensity of the music to always be at a 10. So it's like, even if I wanted to sort of shape it to be like, I want like a, a breakdown section or just like something quieter and then a build towards the end, it didn't, that kind of uh, shape in the music wasn't really effective for video games because they essentially what happens is they're arranging the music on their end. So it could take a player five minutes to beat a boss. It could take them 45 minutes to beat a boss. So they need to have as much music as possible, like at the highest intensity so that they can kind of build the narrative with the music on their end. So it's like, as you're getting closer to beating it, they can add these layers of intensity to like make it feel like you're evolving and, and the story is unfolding. Um, so that was the biggest adjustment. This is just something I never thought about. It was like, you sit down, you write a piece of music and you think like, that's a piece of music. Music, but it's there's other things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing that stuff, which is something I didn't realize, you know, just doing film and TV stuff. I think you nailed it. Uh, Thank you. And, <laughs> and uh, my next question is about the research uh, that you did since when we score something historical, you have to go back in time and find the sound. So I read the Ubisoft article, but it would be great if you can add some more details. Uh, what did you actually could find? Yeah, so the year 885 is when the Siege of Paris took place. And I was like, great, I have no idea what music sounded like then. So I did a lot of research and I hit a brick wall pretty fast um, because there's not a ton of specific musical history, like contextually what was happening in Paris at that time. Um, there's a lot of stuff about sacred music um, because there's a great rich um, history, written history about, about that. Um, but yeah, essentially what I could find was there was so much cross pollination with instruments like in all of Europe and Asia, even at that time, um, it was essentially just, it was all quite primitive in the sense that it was like a wooden box with strings attached to it. And sometimes it's hit or sometimes it's bowed or sometimes it's plucked. And that's like, that's the basis for a lot of what that early instrumental music was. Um, and there was more, you know, complex instruments as well, like hurdy-gurdy um, and, you know, lots of the drums around that time, they were like animal skin drums. So I, I took what I could from that information and 
I tracked down some instruments and just collected some instruments. So I, I have a VL, which is the earliest, um, kind of what we, we would describe as the modern violin now is kind of the first version of that. Um, I got like a dulcimer and a cantelli and a lyre and a bunch of frame drums. And I also played like cello and bass, like more modern instruments, but played in a really, really primitive way so that it felt like, you know, just very raw. Um, and then I found some amazing soloists. So I found um, a very good friend of mine plays the viola da gamba, which is a Baroque instrument. It's from a later period, like during the Renaissance, but she played it kind of in a less traditional way. Um, so it wasn't just like lyrically bowed all the time. It was, you know, plucked or detuned or just like banged on or just like, you know, like really intensely in boss fights, just like playing the, the ostinato on the bottom. Um, so that became really crucial. She also recorded vocals and she did a lot of study on what Norse vocals sounded like. Um, and one of the tracks, Haseti, is in Old Norse, the language Old Norse. Um, and then I found a, a brass player who plays ram's horn, which felt like very Viking-esque. Um, and then I got a hurdy-gurdy player and just some other stuff. So essentially it was really about creating this palette of color and finding what everybody felt like the sound of Paris could be at that time. And it was like kind of a combination of all of those things sort of hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think uh, we, we need a, a time machine for uh, these cases just to travel and, hey guys, what are you listening to and where are you yeah, going? Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, what was uh, the most challenging instrument from that era that you played yourself? I would say I, I can't really play any of them very effectively. Um, the VL, I was able to kind of pick up and figure it out because it's it's very similar to the violin, though it's it's really boxy um so it was it was a little tough to kind of harness it but I think that one was the most natural for me um I think I um I have this like lyre but it's so hard to stay in tune um and that was really challenging for me to figure out how to play so I ended up just kind of bowing a lot of it and making scrapey textures and sounds um and then I hired like an actual musician to play like bazooki and mandolin and all of these other like plucked instruments um, so I think I think the liar was probably probably most challenging for sure I don't know I think it's just because I just don't have the skill set it was too hard for me a few more DLCs and you'll be an expert maybe I'll get it yeah in medieval times yeah and uh, speaking about Ari I think uh, her vocals also fit nature related to the soundtrack how did you two meet each other Ari Mason and I have been friends since we were very young so we're friends from childhood um I think we met when we were 12 or something um and we've been really close ever since and she sang on sang or played or done something on all of my scores she's like an incredibly talented musician um and she never ceases to amaze me she's um a producer and a composer in her own right but her vocal and she's an ancient music expert she has a master's degree in specifically in that so she's an amazing resource for pretty much any kind of musical history um but her vocal stylings are unrivaled i mean she has recorded she recorded on um, my score for jupiter's legacy which is a netflix tv show and she did anything ranging from uh you know like layered microtonal latin chanting to like um rhythmic like grunts to overtone throat singing uh to just like all of these insane techniques that i have never seen any other vocalist be able to do um so naturally she's just like that uh she's just she's she's the best thing about my scores i think because her creativity and her uh just technical prowess is unrivaled so i'm thrilled that she was She, she's such a big part of why the sound of the Siege of Paris is what it is. And I'm, I'm lucky to be able to collaborate with such an amazing musician. <laughs> yeah. If you had a time machine, you definitely should visit Medieval Times and yes. you'll remember the band of Stefan and Dari from the Medieval <laughs> Times, since obviously. Okay. And uh, now uh, we are moving on to some specific questions about the tracks. Did you see how it would look, uh, what your track would accompany? Yeah, so that... That track, Frankia, is made up of two different cues that I wrote. So um, the first, the first part of it is um, ended up being the like the land discovery cue, which is basically what you were saying. It like it comes in whenever you discover a new pro a, a new area. Um, and then the second half of that track is actually the very first thing that I wrote for the entire game, um, and that became what 
was the day exploration queue. And so I did have some gameplay footage to look at when I was writing that. It was just, um, you know, Eivor on a horse, just riding through these gorgeous fields and exploring the land. And I definitely was heavily inspired by that. Um, and that's where the, the theme came out of. So the theme is um, is all throughout that track, Frankia, but um, I wrote it initially and it's played on Viola da Gamba by Ari. Um, and it's like spacious and I wanted it to feel like it had the scope to be like intimate and beautiful, but also like could be quite devastating, like on a bigger epic scale and like exciting. Um, so that was my experimentation with like, how do I, how do I get a theme in here? And I was, I was definitely inspired by, by the visuals. It was just really breathtaking all of the scenery. Okay, and uh, my next question is about the track titled uh, Bishop Angelwin and Count Oda. And uh, there are actually two very different characters. And uh, as we know, Count Oda is a historical figure that was really existing at those times. Uh, but uh, did you think about splitting and maybe making two melodies for each of them? Yeah, they're totally different people. That was basically my fault because I... Essentially, the way it <laughs> this is the very non-romantic version of how video game music can be. Um, I was supposed to, I wrote a boss fight for Charles the Fat, like the very, like the big boss. And then there was an intention to write a boss for Count Odo and Bishop Engelwin, but then they became the same piece of music. Um, so that's like, they were like, we don't need a second one. We'll just use the same music. Um, so I, that was basically just me track naming nothing to do with their character in particular but just like what the association for me was <laughs> in the game um, which is very silly I should have just picked Bishop Engelin or something but um I don't I don't yeah that that's a good question and I have a terrible answer for it <laughs> I, I think it's it's very it's very good uh, honest answer uh, of course <laughs> Bishop needed some kind of evil very evil melody yeah uh, yeah, and uh, also very very short one <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, but I still think uh, they sound uh, very good even in uh, one track I just I just was wondered uh, it was you know kind of a riddle for me I was thinking oh did I miss something there must no, be something. you didn't <laughs> there's no kind of connection <laughs> yeah I was, I was looking for it in the game really Sorry. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you read the, the titles of the tracks and think, mm, did I miss something? My next question is about the track about Charles, uh, obviously the main kind of uh, villain in the game. Um, that, again, that track, Charles the Fat, was um, taken from the, the, the boss fight with Charles. Um, and he, basically I had a capture of the boss fight with him. And I thought that he was like, quite terrifying <laughs> I thought he was quite terrifying um he's a scary guy and but also like you said has there's a lot more depth there so I wanted there to be um that's why I wanted there to be vocals in there to an extent I wanted there to be like a kind of choral element and then I wanted there to be like a chanting so there was like a sense of like something strange something odd happening there um but mostly I was kind of inspired by just how like intense the battle was with him and like to trap him or to like, you know, kill him and all that stuff. So um, yeah, that was the idea for Charles. <laughs> I think it worked uh, well uh, as a music description of the character. If you could add a neighbor track, uh, what, how would it sound? Yeah, that's what a good question. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, it's interesting writing the score for a DLC because you're creating, you're trying to create something unique, but within the world of Valhalla, right? So within the world that Jesper Kid and Sarah Schachner and Einar Selvik created. Um, so I think it was less about like me trying to, the stress wasn't on finding a sound or a theme for Eivor for this DLC, for the story in particular, it was about creating the setting of Paris and um, what it felt like to be a Viking storming the gates of, of Paris at that time and the intensity of that. And um, that that was kind of the focus of it as opposed to like creating a theme for Eivor or something like that. That wasn't something that like I was encouraged to do. Although I do feel like you're with Eivor and you're seeing all of this through her eyes um, or him, depending on how you're playing. Uh, it's it, it just felt like everything that I was writing was through that lens. So it didn't feel like I needed something specific for her. 
though I hope to maybe have a chance in the future to do that. <laughs> and uh, what film genres do you like writing soundtracks for the most? What genres? Yeah, for films. Um, pretty much anything. I'm the kind of composer that can get a little bit stir crazy writing in a similar style or similar genre all the time. Um, but I really, I, I wrote the score for Jupiter's Legacy, as I mentioned before, and that's like superhero meets sci-fi. And that was a really fun one because it was a bit genre bending in and of itself. So the score ended up having, you know, big orchestral symphonic moments and then like heavy distorted electronic moments and then like punk and industrial rock and experimental contemporary, like it got to be all sorts of different things. So I loved being able to live in that kind of creative world. And I hope to do more stuff that I can just kind of go wild with. Uh, what are your sources of inspiration? As a musician, I know inspiration is very important. Some, sometimes you can write for hours through the nights and sometimes just there is no inspiration and you can basically write anything. I'm mostly inspired by things that are not music. Um, which is a weird thing to say. I think, you know, this this career and the, these jobs can be so demanding that it's like, you can't wait for inspiration to hit. You just have to do it. As you said, like there's not really an inspiration for it. Um, I'm inspired oftentimes by the story, by the cinematography of that someone captures. Um, I'm, I'm almost, you know, that's like 95% of the inspiration that I get is from the story I'm actually writing the music for. Um, like there's always something I can find that's like, the key to all of it for me as, as a composer. Um, and outside of the film or show or game or whatever I'm working on, I find inspiration in a lot of stuff, like just going for a walk and just being a human being for a little bit and not being in the studio. Um, like I'm inspired by other people, um, not even necessarily their work as a musician, but just like people and relationships. Uh, I'm inspired by food, <laughs> like, you know, other other creative things I find myself being more inspired by than like, you know, listening to a new album, although that can sometimes, you know, check that box. But I, of I often find that it's not music that inspires me the most. And uh, what kind of uh, movies do you like uh, to watch? Good question. Um, I, I like so many different kinds of films. Um, I'd say like some of my favorite films are like Forrest Gump, Shawshank Redemption, very classic films. I also love Alfred Hitchcock. So Vertigo is one of my favorite films. Um, I lately, I honestly haven't over the past couple of years, I feel I have seen very few films and just have watched so much more television. Um, I think that's just sort of the trend. There just feels like there's a lot more, um, like longer narratives in TV and there's some really interesting stuff happening. So I've enjoyed, um, a lot of different things. Uh, there's a show called Search Party that I absolutely loved, uh, Pen15, which is a very different thing. Um, Queen's Gambit was really nice. I love Ozark. Uh, let's see what other films that I enjoyed. Oh, I, you know, it, I'm catching up on like seeing films that I have, haven't seen before, that it's like always been on my list, but I haven't seen it. Um, and I recently saw No, Cult no Country for Old Men, which I thought was fantastic. Absolutely loved that. And I watched Fart and Fink, which I had never seen before. Um, so I went on a bit of a Coen Brothers kick there uh, during <laughs> during quarantine. And that was really fantastic. So I, yeah, I like all different sorts of stories and, and genres and everything. I'll, I'll watch, I'll watch anything. <laughs> yeah, that's the way very, of the world now. <laughs> very convenient. Okay, and you also scored uh, the documentary Marvel's uh, 616. So how was it work working in the Marvel universe in terms of music? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, so Marvel 616 is, is kind of an interesting one because it's, um, it's a documentary TV series about Marvel creators, just like different people within the Marvel universe creating things. Um, and they were all totally different. So I scored two of those episodes and it was, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, do we want to like make a hint to Marvel music? And there was always like, no, we don't really want to do that. Just focus on the story in the episode. Um, so I did one episode that was about the women behind Marvel, which was really fascinating because just over the course of history that Marvel has existed, there have been these incredible women behind the scenes and learning more about them was really fun. The score for that ended up being, there was, it, it was a range of stuff. Um, you know, when we learned about Miss Marvel for the first time, there was like a sort of like big band jazz type of thing, um, just to like reflect the era. 
And then there was like obviously some more modern scoring stuff in there. Um, her character grew over time and in history so it became a little bit more symphonic and like with with horns and stuff like that the score did that to reflect that um and then the other episode i did was totally different it was about um this high school in florida who puts on marvel plays and just basically about how the marvel narratives and the stories have shaped these kids in drama class and that was really special it just got it was like a very heartwarming wholesome story that you know, it's rare to capture that kind of thing. So the score, the score was sort of like musical, like it, it, I wanted to reflect the sense of like theater. So there's lots of like clapping and snaps and vocals um, and stomping, you know, like other sounds that we associate with the stage sometimes. Uh, and then some other like more modern, like indie, indie elements as well, like smaller chamber stuff. So that was, that was fun. That was a fun series. And then, uh, now there should be a Marvel character that you like the most, probably. Wh- who is it? I love um, Kamala Khan. I learned more about her um, through doing that series. Uh, I think she's amazing, and I think she's an amazing figure for young girls and just young people in general. I think it's a great, she has a great story. So it was fun learning more about her. And Miss Marvel TV series is always upcoming. When you get uh, awards, do you have uh, the idea how will you change your Instagram tagline? <laughs> no, I hope I hope that I get to keep that. I think I will keep it for a long time. I appreciate your optimism that I will win awards, but <laughs> um, yes, my Instagram tagline is not award-winning composer, and that is mainly just like a tongue-in-cheek criticism of how everybody says that they're an award-winning composer regardless of what the award is and that's fine you know everybody live your life do what you want to do um for me I I am not I have never been the kind of person that's very motivated by awards um I I I think that's a cool thing to say it's not like 100 true but like definitely this point in my life maybe in the past I've been a little bit more like wanting to win the gold kind of thing but I care less and less about that as I get older and the more I am a professional in this industry, it's less about recognition from my peers or from the outside world. And it's more about me finding collaborators who make me feel fulfilled as a, as an artist, an artist, um, like as a composer, it's, that's the, that's the thing that means the most to me, um, you know, having a shiny trophy or something and, and getting your name on something is probably feels really nice, but At the end of the day, I think like I lose focus if those are the things that I'm worried about. I think I need to be worried about creating with people and and evolving and doing different stuff. I know there is an alliance of, uh, I think it's called right, an alliance of uh, female Women fem- composers. Yeah. composers. Yeah. Can you tell us more about it, your role in it and uh, your activities in it? Yeah, so the Alliance for Women Film Composers is an amazing resource um, for female creators, songwriters, arrangers, orchestrators, composers. Um, essentially, the mission is to uh, create an inclusive space uh, for female creators. Um, you know, so often I hear the line, like, there just aren't any female composers. And to that, I always answer, like, look at the Alliance for Women Film Composers. We have an entire registry on the website filled with hundreds of female composers where you can read about them, look, listen to their work, go to their website, hire them. Um, so the Alliance does a very good job of creating visibility for female composers, which I think oftentimes is the hardest part um, because people can be so ignorant. It's just like, oh, they're not getting hired because there's none of them. It's like, that certainly is not the case. Although I think there are, you know, has been a lot of, you know, just lack of encouragement or systemic sexism that has occurred in this industry, um, a lot of misogyny. So that's why a lot of women have not gotten, you know, the opportunities that they deserve. The Alliance is excellent for lifting those, those people up and giving them a space to exist and show other people that, um, as well as a lot of outreach and education. Um, so myself and two other composers uh, founded a mentorship program with the Alliance And that connects uh, younger up and coming female composers with big A-list composers like Harry or John Powell, Michael Dana, um, Rachel Portman. And so that was really important for us to create a space because we saw that there was a lack of accessibility for female composers to these bigger com- successful composers in the industry. 
um, like they didn't have that guidance or they weren't able to just like understand how you create a career like this professionally. Um, so I think things like that. And I also think things like just going to an elementary school, like female composers going and showing them instruments and just like being like, we exist, you can be this. I think those are the really critical, crucial things that we can do to shape younger generations of composers and show them you can do this because I think that has been an issue. It's just, it doesn't, we don't have enough visibility to affect that. I think it's very important uh, initiative. Uh, I see how it is slowly changing with directors. We see more and more female directors and I would love to see it's change also with female composers and more and more of them appearing. I know there are yeah. a, a lot of uh, myths uh, about this profession of a film composer, for example, some people still think that 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 guy that is written everywhere, he played every instrument and sit yeah. in, in every in every chair of, of the orchestra. Yeah, just <laughs> just just the one. <laughs> yeah, just just that one guy that he was everywhere. I'm sure one more girls uh, following the initiative would like to also try themselves being film composers and and write beautiful soundtracks, uh, which will be needed everywhere in TV series and video games as well and films. Uh, and what would you advise to young girls that maybe already know the instrument they want to start with? Uh, how can they get into this profession of a film composer? How they can plan building a career in this field? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's, it's very hard when you're younger to try to just figure out what the path is. And it's even more difficult to try to dispense advice on it because there isn't one path to get there. My, my biggest advice is to, my biggest piece of advice would be to be the best that you can on your instrument, write music, don't try to write music that you think other people will like or music that will fit into like the film scoring world. I think now more than ever we need diverse different voices so like being genuine to yourself and writing music that feels genuine to you I think is the most important thing by far then more practically speaking I think finding finding programs that will give you a little bit more insight into how this works um, there's some great I mean we have YouTube it's an amazing resource um, and Catherine Dern is an awesome composer and she does great videos just tutorials about like how this kind of process works and some of the fundamentals um, there's also excellent um, education, you know, just programs for film scoring. Berkeley College of Music is a great resource. There's Berkeley in Valencia. There's NYU. Um, there's Columbia College in Chicago. And then out here, there's UCLA and USC. There's the Pacific Northwest Film Scoring Program. Uh, so there's excellent programs all over the country that will help you, help guide you if this is something that you like. Um, but I think the fundamentals of music is just like, be the best musician that you can be. And coupled with that, watch a lot of films, watch a lot of TV shows, um, learn what, like learn to read picture, find the emotion in it, like pay attention to the music. I think just those kinds of simple studies are the most important way to get a foundation in this career. I was so happy to meet you and see you in person. You are so friendly and cheerful. It's ju just, uh, amazing just to talk and hear uh, and listen to how you tell about my dream profession. Thank you for talking with me. <laughs> you had excellent, you had excellent questions. It was very, just very thoughtful. So yeah. thank you. I wish you all the best in your career. Of course, I will follow and uh, I, I would love to talk again about your new soundtracks. It would be uh, really great. And uh, I also wish you to have a great upcoming weekend because the composers should also rest. It's true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Steph. It was Thank you, Alex. It was such a pleasure. Yeah. It was so nice to meet you. Thank yeah. you. And yeah, let's talk again soon. Okay. Yes. Okay. Bye, Bye Alex.